Hey all, how you doing? This is Blair Sinta. Welcome to Recording Drums. Today my guest is Matt Chamberlain. All right, no introduction necessary to the world of recording drums and Matt. Instead of listing a handful of credits, you know, that would take, you know, a year with Matt, I thought I'd just give a little uh, story that I have about Matt. Um, I've been fortunate to be friends with Matt for a bunch of years now. And uh, back in 2007, I was on tour with Damian Rice and Matt was on tour with Tori Amos and we were playing the same festival. And I think we were in England. I don't remember. Somewhere over in Europe. But uh, I was watching Matt play his set with Tori and I was standing probably about 10 feet behind him. Um, and he was just like demolishing. It was awesome. But one thing I noticed is that, uh, as hard as he was playing, he was bringing the beater out of the head, uh, the bass drum head. And it, I just, I couldn't believe it that he was playing that loud and getting that tone and bringing the beat out of her head. So I realized, well, that can be done. And that was one of the things that, uh, I really worked on right after that. I tried to figure out how to do that. And, um, just as far as recording drums and bass drum tone, I feel like that's helped me a lot uh, with with sound overall. But that just came from literally standing there watching him and that experience. So anyway, this interview is pretty fun. He's going to show us his studio a little bit. We talk about certain things. You know, this conversation could have gone on. I, ha I have a lot of questions for him, but, uh, you know, it's nice and informative and long. So if you're enjoying what I'm doing with this podcast, please check out my courses, improve your groove, uh, lots of lessons on things I've worked on over the years to help improve my, my feel, my consistency, my time, things like that. Two hours of lessons in there. And my other course called Introduction to Recording. This covers uh, how I go about picking drums for sounds for particular songs, um, what I think about, uh, recording with one mic, recording with two mics, different, uh, setups, mic patterns, things like that. Three mics, four mics, uh, two Beatles mics, setups used by Jeff Emmerich, a three mic technique and a six mic technique and a whole bunch of other stuff. Those are available on my website, BlairSinta.com. And I also have a free PDF if you just want to go there. Uh, which is my go-to recording gear. All right, that's on the front page of my website. It's a free PDF. Can shows you shows you the gear that I use in my room here. And without further ado, let's get to talking to Matt. Here we go. Maybe it says recording in progress. Okay, got it. So now the other option was leave. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have that option? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll see you later, Blair. All right. Bye. Nice. That was thank was nice you. talking about recording. Appreciate you showing up. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, man? Is that sunlight? Do you have natural light in there? I have just a bunch of these like lamps that were here when I moved in. Oh, wow. I can cool. take you on a tour of my studio if you want to see it. Let's go on a tour, dude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. I have to disconnect this and then you won't see me, but I'll have the, the iPad will be going showing you sweet there's so there's my little uh console my little api awesome with wow. all the outboard stuff there's your board little wow. api patch bay mic pre's synthesizer land mm. coffee making station most importantly chair. chair very very important and then this is the room of shit ah Oh, wow. So I got, so I got like the normal, well, semi-normal drum kit here, all mic'd up, ready to go. Um, and then this world over here is percussion land. Right. And that kind of, puts, that kind of stays up all the time, like some kind of. Kind of, yeah, I have everything kind of always patched in so I can easily record by myself. Hey, do you want to, so, do you want to turn the iPad sideways? What does it? There we go. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah. So there's drum land. Okay. Uh, percussion. I'll, you know, I'll put stuff on this little table or I'll move the table out of the way and like use the concert bass drum or kungas or whatever, you know, whatever else. 
And then this weird contraption I just set up yesterday. It's the Taos drum kit. Yep. With uh, <clears throat> the old Mastro. The old Mastro and my live looping. <laughs> I have like a little live looping station. Right. That uh, so so I'll just make I'll make little uh things here. Like sometimes I won't even loop. I'll just record it with one mic as like a percussion overdub as well. But this is the room. Do you have to repatch for any of this stuff, or are you kind of like it's all ready to go? Um, it's all it's all ready to go. A lot of times I'll, you know, once I once we start talking about like how I have the mics going on the kit. I'll, I'll share certain mics like, like you see this little, uh, Altec mic here. Yes. I'll take like, that one's really squashed as well as this 47 right here. Okay. So I can move those to like, if I want to add that to the, this kit, I can just move, you know, move this over here okay. or, or add it to the percussion land. Yep. As well as this is like a room mic, this AEA. Yep. yep. It's like a close room mic. So I can turn that around and use that anywhere else. Um, and then these little Soyuz mics here. Oh, yeah. These little, oh, these little gaudy, yep. gaudy Soyuz mics. <laughs> I use those for the percussion. Um, <clears throat> but I could also use them. See, like everything's all patched in. So I can just use these mics wherever I want right. as long as I remember what channel they're on. And... And then I got this Mezzanovic mic up here for the far room mic. Oh wow, cool! It's like a, it's a, it's a ribbon mic. Okay. And obviously, yeah. And a lot of times I'll just leave it unaffected, and then you know if somebody gets the tracks, they can squash the room mics if they want, um, or I'll put like the transient designer on it and just blow the room up, you know. So. Is that kind of a, a semi-permanent setup, like the general mic thing? Yeah. Okay. On your drums, too, huh? Yeah, like the... Um, yeah, I mean, I just kind of... For for most stuff, I'll just leave, like, a stereo mic up for the... You know, like, I'll have a stereo mic, the mics on the toms, kick in and out, snare top and bottom, hi-hat mic, and then... You know, the, the room mics I just showed you, which are not affected. I mean, nothing's affected, like nothing's compressed. Right. Um, the only EQ I have is on this t the top snare mic has a little bit of high end added. And the inside kick mic has, you know, the classic bump at 60. Right. And a little bit, maybe a little bit of high end as well. But nothing, nothing is squashed or compressed or... It's it's just those mics I showed you the um, Altec and the excuse me and the forty seven are super squashed so I just can mix those in with the regular mics to add that kind of like side chain compression. So you kind of know like that's uh, that's really interesting to me just from like especially like like I'm like thinking about like your your solo records and stuff uh -huh. where they're like I mean there's everything is like super defined sonically but it's it's almost like it's the drum, like, like you, you almost have like a very particular room sound that happens like, like open, wide open drums, but, and like, I feel like often those are, uh, like skewed toward roomy drum sounds. Uh huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Like I'll just, so the mic setup is pretty right. much like standard for you. Yeah. I don't really do too much. The only thing that changes the sound drastically is just changing the drums out. Right. Okay. Or, or tuning the, or, you know, muffling them or I, I try to leave them. I, I like the idea of making the drums sound the way you want at the source. And then the mics just pick it up. Right. And then, you, and then from there you can go, you know, anywhere with mixing. I mean, you can right. tweak shit out for ever. And Do you spend a lot of time tweaking shit before you send stuff. Or you kind of, is it depend on who you're sending it to? Tweaking, like which way? Like, like post, post, post playing, just, you know, add it, like fucking with mics or, or. Um, no. Doing much. No, it's pretty much the way it comes in. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'll do a lot of like back and forth, you know, like I have a, I don't know if you saw the monitor behind the kit, but right. that's connected to the monitor or to the computer in here. I have a long HDMI cable. 
Okay. So I can sit out there, play a bit, listen back, or sometimes I'll just come in here and listen back and um, just make sure everything's the way I want it. Okay. And then, and then listen back to it with the music I'm recording to make sure everything's kind of speaking right. with, with the instrumentation around it, you know? Okay. And if, and if that's, and if something isn't working, I'll change the drum out or change the cymbals or uh, <clears throat> maybe EQ a little bit of more, more high end or less high end on the kick or snare. Okay. I guess I, I guess I just figured you were changing mics a lot for some reason. I just figured like, ah, it's a whole new setup, whole new mic setup also. Whole new drum setup, whole new mic setup. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I, I would, but you know, since the pandemic hit, I just got into this thing of just keeping the mics the way they are okay. and just changing the drums out. And I was always surprised at how the sound would drastically change from me simply just changing the drums. Like I didn't have to really do much. I mean, right. if I was going for like a super uh, extreme kind of drum sound, I could just add a few weird mics or something that are distorted or, uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of kept it really simple so that when people get the tracks, there's nothing going on and they can, you know, as long as the drums sound good with the song, then they can go from there. That was kind of the idea I had. And plus, you know, when, you know how it is when you're engineering yourself, you don't want to, or at least I don't want to <clears throat> make it where the drums are so full of character that they can't just go back to like a natural drum sound if they want. You right. Know? Right. I'd rather give them the option. It's, it's kind of like, I, I think of it like cooking. It's like, you get the base ingredients, like, you know, there's just the basic mics on the kit with the drums sounding really good. You know, like the big thing with me that I always obsess about is when I'm playing, I'll hit the kick and I'll hit the snare. And if the toms are going, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I'll try to find what's going on and deal with it, but still make the toms sound good. And um, I mean, if I can't get that together, I'll just take the toms off the kit and, uh, <laughs> Right. Cause you know, a lot of times you don't even play a Tom, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. I remember some, uh, a mixer friend of mine saying like, I hate it when they don't play a Tom the whole time. And then right at the end you hit the dig a rack Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's cause you, yeah. Cause by the end of the song, you're like, shit, I better hit these things. They're sitting there <laughs> resonating. Um, but that's the big thing I try to do is like, make sure like if they want to like, like make the drum kit super squashed and compressed, like a lot of people do now mm -hmm. that when they do that, that the toms aren't going making a note or yeah. screwing with the backbeat sound, you know, like that kind of thing. Right. But, um, I just kind of keep it real simple like that, just so that it's, uh, pliable later, you know, but right. also sounds really good with the track just the way it is. Right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I, I feel like you think about pitch a lot, drum, drum pitch to the song. No, come on, not, really? Not if it's, I mean, only if it's like a problem. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, I don't consciously think like, oh, I'm going to tune my drums to a pitch. It's all just kind of uh, a byproduct of, you know, you're hitting your snare and you're like, oh shit, the Tom is going. <laughs> right. So should I tune the snare down to see if I can get the Tom to not resonate with the snare or do I tune the tom down and or up right and leave the snare word you know it's like that kind of thing you know what i mean that's sure interesting i always felt like i've like recognized in your playing like definitive pitches according to the song really yeah oh wow i had no idea <laughs> <laughs> lying I'm an idiot making shit up. That. yeah i've worked with engineers that that'll actually like have you ever worked with eric valentine i only once yeah did he come out and tune your drums to, cause he was like tuning my drum notes and stuff. Like, yeah. It was like ready. It was ready to go. Yeah. He, yeah. I was surprised. I was like, man, I, I didn't hear that, but that's cool that you're tuning it to whatever you're hearing. Cause I don't generally hear if the drum is in tune with the song. I just hear if it's out of tune. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like if it's, if it's annoying with the track, then I'll do something. <laughs> Right. I got you. I got you. Okay. So you're not thinking about it that much. That's interesting. All right. I made that shit up. Whatever. <laughs> but I probably, but you know, like everybody, I probably have a preference for 
where I like my drums tuned. Um, right. Just, I don't even like, you know, I have all these snares here and I'm like, I'll take them out and I'll be like, Oh, this snare is kind of tuned to the same pitch as this other snare and this other snare. And it's like, I didn't consciously do that. It's just, right. I guess that's my preference. Like, your thing. Yeah. I just like, it. it's like, Oh, this sounds good. This 12 inch Tom sounds good to me at this note for some reason, or within these like two or three notes. Right. Okay. Um, and they all end up sounding the same. <laughs> which is funny, which means I can get rid of a bunch of shit, right? I mean, there you I go. Can, Time to scale down again. I just, yeah, I just need to, I need, I need to scale it back to the, the way it used to be, where I just had like a drum kit and maybe like two snare drums. You had your that's from when high pitch snare drum and your low pitch snare drum. <laughs> when you're like 73, you'll do that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I can't actually move my drums anymore. Exactly. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not lifting another floor tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So when you were at, I remember one time we were hanging out in Seattle and we, we didn't, we drove by your studio. We didn't actually go in, but were you, this is, maybe this is a two, two part question, but when you started recording with Critters in Seattle, were, it, was that like, like, let's say the first record, was that just studio time you guys got or was it your place? The first record we had, we were signed to Epic Records and got a record budget. Remember oh. those? Yeah. And we hired a producer, uh, you know, Dennis Herring. Oh, yeah. He did like those Modest Mouse records and totally. I mean, tons of great records. And he produced that record and we did it in Stone Gossard's basement Okay, that he had just built out into a recording studio. So we were kind of like the, the guinea pigs for to make, you know, to make sure his studio worked. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and Dennis Herring had just bought, it wasn't Pro Tools, it was called Sound Tools. It was like yes. two stereo tracks that you could edit between. Yep. And, you know, we didn't really have songs. We were just improvising. We had like maybe two or three ideas. And uh, then a couple of songs were just created with Dennis, you know, taking loops of us playing and then us playing over it. And then we had a budget to mix it at uh, Bad Animals. Or Lo actually, there was a studio right next to it called Lawson's. Okay. Um, that had like old API consoles. It was like a classic seventies studio in Seattle. I think Steve Miller did some records there and tower power, oh. but that studio isn't there anymore. Okay. It's probably a condo, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like everything else in Seattle, but, um, but that record was not um, recorded on our own. The second and third records we did, did a majority of that live at the OK Hotel. Remember that club? No, in Seattle? I don't uh, remember that. That's not there anymore either. OK, <laughs> that got destroyed in the earthquake. We had an earthquake in Seattle. I saw you guys at the Alligator Lounge down here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With fat, with uh, fat and bloated. Remember that yeah. band? Uh huh. Exactly. With Levita. Wasn't Levita playing in that band with Kephas? I think you're that right. Yeah. Yeah, that was a crazy night. And it was right by the 405. That, yeah, yeah. I love that club. Yep, it was noisy Nels, in there. Nels Klein used to play every week with his brother. and Exactly, yeah. Nels used to play all the time. Yep. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so, so the second record, we did it live at the OK Hotel, and we bought a bunch of ADATs. <laughs> so we recorded it with ADATs, but we rented some outboard gear so we could record it. Okay. You know, have it sound nice. And those were just all improvs. And with part of our next rec record budget we had, I bought a Pro Tools rig. Okay. And took a lot of those improvs and edited them myself. It almost went completely insane trying because I had to figure out Pro Tools <laughs> at the same time. You know, so that was the third one record. Is that what the one, the green cover? The second one. Oh, the second was called Host. Was right. called Host. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And we did that with Eric Ross, the producer. Oh yeah, Eric, right. Okay. Wow. Yep. So, okay, so you were tweaking back. You st is that when you kind of started to like tweak like hands-on? Yeah, that's when I I got the bug. Yeah. I was like, you know, I had my four-track recorder, cassette four-track and I'd record all the critters rehearsals and and uh and then as I started to be employed more <laughs> I just started buying things like, oh, here's I, what kind of a mic do I need for this or that? And, right. And then I got, then I went off the deep end and started, 
I mean, this was like the mid to late nineties. Yeah. When gear was still kind of affordable, like really affordable comparatively. Yeah. And I was starting to work a little bit more as a session musician. So, and you know, I was living in Seattle, so I didn't have any overhead in my life at all. So I just took all my money I made and bought shit. I was like, Hmm, I'm doing this session next week. So now I can buy a 67. <laughs> uh, Okay. Which, and the, and this month, that one was probably only like what three grand back then or something like uh yeah yeah 2800 bucks i got one for 2800 dollars. that's insane i still have it yeah I, I, <laughs> that and um i bought a neve console oh. an 8014 console wow when i was on the first tori amos tour i did mm-hmm. and i bought it at a um i kept asking promoters that were coming to the gigs that were taking Tori to interviews at colleges and radio stations mm-hmm. in Europe. And I was asking him, do you guys ever have like old gear that you have like in your storage rooms? Cause it, this was like the era that people were getting rid of all that shit. Totally. Like, yeah. You I know, 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 they're buying those Yamaha O2Rs uh-huh. to do all, like, all that shit was like out, throw it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I found one, I found it in, it was a college. I think it was in Stockholm. Oh, and wow. it was kind of, it wasn't fully loaded. It's, it was a 16 channel Neve console with the 1073s in it. Mm-hmm. Didn't have the compressors in it. The power supply was European. So I had to buy another power supply that would work in the, in the U S. Okay. So anyways, I had that. And then I bought like a 16 track, two inch Studer machine. Wow. And it was like, that was it. That was my little rig with the pro tools rig that I had. That's a pretty and- rig. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I mean, back then it was super affordable, right? Like, you know, I mean, it wasn't that much money. And, um, so I had that in that warehouse in Seattle for years. Okay. And, and of course, right when I bought it was when I started touring all the time and working in other places other than Seattle. So I never used that shit. All my friends would tell me, Oh, your Neve is awesome. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyways, I, I, uh, eventually sold the Neve and, uh, and the scooter, okay. but, uh, you know, I kind of just whittled it down to what I really needed. So everybody used uh, the tape machine, but you were responsible for keeping it up, like throwing. Yeah, it. basically <laughs> I had to pay the rent on the place. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, if a mic had a problem or noise, I had to go get it fixed and, oh my God. but it was cool. My friends, um, that were using it are great engineers and they were doing some cool records. So it was, it was fun to see. Right. And to hear all that, that stuff being used. Right. So it was part of like, your like, t- like getting into like tweaking and, and like making those make, like doing what you were doing on those critters records. Was that like from being in like LA sessions with like, like the like Fiona Apple record was like a, like s- sonically was like super different, like palette wise. Right. Like, was it, was it like absorbing all that stuff where you kind of wanted to get into it? Yeah. Yeah. Just hanging out with people like, like John Bryan was on those records, those Fiona Apple records. And he is so passionate about recording. You know, he's like a total, yeah. he's, he's almost like a, a historian for recording. He knows, he just, he just knows so much about like the instruments and the mics and the mic pre's and all this stuff. So if you hang out with him for like a week, you know, by the end of the week, you're like on eBay, like going, oh, fuck, I need to buy it. <laughs> you know, it gets you all excited about like, oh, I got to find one of these mic prees. This was the one that was used on, right. you know, this right. obscure, awesome record that, right. you know. And uh, so it was a lot of that kind of stuff um, where I was learning as I went, like, oh, that's how they got those kind of drum sounds. Um, you know, a lot of times they'd just be the drums. Right. Because up until that point, I didn't, I, you know, Back in the mid nineties uh, to late nineties, vintage drums weren't a thing really. You know what I mean? Yeah, nobody like, wanted own, like an old Ludwig kit. It's just like you just had like you know had what at the time I think I was playing <clears throat> DW still or um, A. It was like that era when I was like I think I switched over to A. for a second. Yeah, but um, you just wanted like drum sounds that worked that you know and your kit could hold up to like being thrown in the back of the van and right. Worrying and all that kind of shit. They did one thing. You were happy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Plus I was so broke from buying recording gear. I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and plus that was like, you know, the internet, the, you know, the whole internet thing wasn't a big thing. Like you couldn't, 
go online and go to like Revival Drum Shop and go, ooh, look at that snare drum. That's true. That was yeah. even like pre eBay. Yeah, that was like yeah. You would get not so modern drummer like the pamphlet yes. booklet. And in the back, it'd be like, so-and-so in Dayton, Ohio has these drums for sale. And you call them up and, you know, That's hey, <laughs> you know, that kind of shit. That's right. That's right. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. That's that's amazing, too, actually, even in your gear buying, which is why you were asking people. Because, like, eBay wasn't even until, like, 2000, what, two, maybe? I think Not so. Better, but so. Yeah, it was, like, late 90s. I don't even remember when eBay came around, but because, yeah, it wasn't because like I, and I, I had dial up in my like little house down here, like in 2000. So it couldn't have been, maybe it was around, I don't know, whatever, who cares? Yeah. It was a long time ago, yeah. but it was that, tr- it was that transition time when it was like, you know, I'd get like, uh, actually I remember being at like a coffee shop that had a magazine stand in Seattle and I saw this little pamphlet magazine called Tape Op. Right. And I was like, tape? No way. Like, this is a magazine about recording? What the fuck? And so, <laughs> so I bought it, and I, would just, I was like, oh, my God, these guys are talking about all this gear yeah. that I've never heard of. Because I just, I don't know, you know, I didn't grow up in recording studios or anything. Right. I was just learning as I went. Right. But um, that was another bad influence, man. Early Tape Op really screwed me up. <laughs> i understand oh. i still i still like i mean i still get it right and like i almost you know it's weird i almost don't want to read it because it's like going on ebay it's like once you do it yeah your endorphins start to go you're like ah, i think I, you start to rationalize i'm like okay if i sell this i can get this and you know yeah. i don't know if i need that thing over there anymore but maybe I'll, you know yeah well that is part of what's been going on with me during the pandemic is and not changing out too much on my recording setup is I'm realizing that a lot of the sound, I mean, if you got like decent mics, like a, you know, for overheads, like a condense, you know, you you can use condensers or, you know, ribbon mics are great. Coles are always great. Or, you know, there's a lot of new ribbon mic companies, but just getting like basic good mics on your kit, and then just changing the drums or tuning the drums or, you know, putting shit on the drums or taking things, you know, just that changes the sound so much. And is even, I think that's more of a, a it's more effective for changing your tones than buying new gear because the gear will give you a certain thing, but it's not going to make your drum sound great. You know, it's like, it's an acoustic instrument. You got to make them sound good. You right. know, Right. I'm sure you've done recordings with, you know, 57s and like maybe even like a 57 for an overhead and it probably sounds great. You just can EQ a little bit of shit into it. And yeah, well, even, or even something with like two mics, like a 57 and a, and a, like a D one twelve or something. And you're like, Oh yeah. You can make cool shit with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was just, um, I, I subscribed to that mix with the masters thing online. Yeah. And I was watching one with, um, Nick, uh, what's his name? Nick Lanay. He's the guy that did uh, like the most recent Nick Cave records and did some. Uh, um, no, wait a minute. No, that wasn't the guy. I was. I, I do like him though. He did. He did this uh, Anna Colvie record. Okay. Have you ever heard her? Mm-mm. Anna Colvie. She's a British singer, guitar player. Okay. Really cool sounding record. But he also did like Kate Bush, The Dreaming. Okay. Like back in the eighties and. Okay. Um. Uh, what's what's the band uh pil you did a pil record really cool drum sounds but anyways i'm thinking of somebody else now it was uh, uh what's the guy's name that works at atticus ross who works with trent Reznor. Trent, yeah they, they, they were talking about a song they did on one of those eps they just released and how they used the crown uh uh what do you call it uh what do you call those mics? It's like a flat mic that you put on the floor. The PZM? PZM, yeah. They, they use like a crown P- PZM <laughs> for the overhead mic on the drum kit. Oh, wow. On, um, I think it's called God Turn Out the Lights or, or uh, what is it called? Um, oh, oh and not cool nail track? Yeah, it's on a... Oh, wow, that's an interesting idea, actually. Yeah, it and it has like a really cool raw sound to it. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, they use, I'm sure they used other mics around the kit, you know, just probably real simple mics, like the usual kick mic, right. you know, whatever, whatever it may be, the beta 52 or the 112 or the, right. Um, but it's, uh, oh, let me find the, it's called, uh, oh shit. That's not that important. Anyways, it's just the <laughs> idea that you can use whatever the hell you want for right. the drum sound, as long as the drums are tuned a certain way and work with the music you're doing. It gives it like an attitude. You know? was, was there like a certain engineer or what, or maybe it was John that like, or was it just obvious to you when you started working more in, in like studios in LA, like you had to do these things or were there's, was there somebody in particular that was like super inspiring to start manipulating, you know, yeah. like that. Yeah. I spent, I, I like one of my first sessions I did down here was with this band called the wild colonials. Uh -huh. They were like a local LA band and they uh, were going to do their record with Chad Blake. Yeah. And so we went into the old sound factory. It was just for a day. We had one day to do the whole record. Okay. And, and I remember we got drum sounds and, he put his binaural head as the drum overhead mic. Yeah. And then he had like a uh, tubing, like corrugated tubing from like home Depot with mics in it pointed at the drum kit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just yeah. crazy shit like that. And um, <clears throat> he had like a 57 kind of by the rack Tom going into his level lock. Yeah. You know, the, that sure podium mic compressor. Yep. And, but the overheads, the, um, binaural head microphone each side went into an la2a compressor and a sans amp right and so anyways he 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 was like you know he, he did the thing where he's like hey just play a little bit and i'll record some and you can come in and listen and so i came in and i listened and it blew my mind because <laughs> i <I'd> never <laughs> i never ran my drums through like sans amps and had that kind of extreme compression go i've just never done it before right at that point and I just was like, what the hell are you doing? This is awesome. It actually made me think I have to play my drums differently now. I can't actually hit my cymbals like I do live because of all the distortion and compression. Yep. Um, you know, so I start thinking like, oh, I need to tune my drums in a different way too, because if there's any kind of ringing, that's going to come out more than usual and mm -hmm. all that kind of shit. But um, that was like the first thing. And then I discovered... Like shortly after doing that record, I discovered some records he had done recently, like um, those Latin Playboy records. Yeah, which incredible, still are incredible. But I found out later that you know I thought it was all him, but um, David Hildago recorded a majority of that with like a boombox, like oh, the drums. Really? Like he would he mounted the boombox like over the drum kit <laughs> and played shit and used oh, that okay. weird. And you know, like those built-in limiters and those yeah, totally. Boxes. So a lot of that is that. And then they took his four-track recordings and then transferred it to a Studer twenty-four track and added more shit. But Chad, I, I didn't, didn't realize that because those two records, what Colossal Head and uh, the Los Lobos records, like Kiko oh, and Colossal yeah. Head, yeah, 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 those are great. Those are incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're like an audio. I, but that's like some audio stuff I'd never heard before. Right. I think it's like a new thing, really. I mean, I couldn't tell you that there was, like, I, I don't recall any record sounding like that ever. Right. And still kind of don't, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the Bone Machine record, the Tom Waits Bone Machine. Oh, yeah, that's right. Around the same time. Yeah. It was just a lot of, like, compression and distortion on drums, which hadn't been used a lot. You know, everybody was going for this real pristine, fat, hi-fi drum sound yeah. up until then, to a certain extent. I mean, like everybody in Seattle, like all the bands in Seattle were going for more like that Steve Albini room sound. Yeah, you just hit your drums as hard as you could at that point, At that, yeah. especially in the early 90s, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it, it was coming out of like the 80s where everything was so dead and you had to like, hit your drums at the same velocity because you had to open the gates up. You weren't allowed to have like dynamics. Right. You know, and then it went into like spin doctors, like 
ghost notes, wide open snare drums, uh, and then, you know, sound garden stuff or, and then you could tune your drums wide open and they would just use the room mics. It was like the John Bonham thing where yeah. it sounded great because the mics on the drums weren't so loud because, you know, the drums were wide open and ringing. So, so, so when you worked with Chad that first time, was that, so and all that stuff you were talking about, was that something that kind of like immediately dawned on you? Like, holy shit, I need, like, did you adapt immediately or did you feel like you had to go work on that shit? Like, I'm going to consciously play my cymbals quieter or, or do you feel like you just kind of like started to do that because you, that's, it was coming back into your cans and you're like, okay, I need to control this. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I immediately went back to Seattle and bought a Sans amp oh. and then put it on my four track recorder and started recording myself okay. with it. And then I just started discovering okay. like what you could do. And then I also realized, well, yeah, it, it makes sense for me to have that sound in my headphones so I can hear what I'm doing, how, how I'm affecting it. You right. Know what I mean? Right. It's kind of like a, a guitar player that has like a, an effects pedal on his guitar. You play differently depending on if it's distortion or delay or, you know, right. if you're, if you don't hear it and you're playing your guitar, then you're going to, you're not going to know what's going on. It makes sense to have sound, you know? So, and of course, nowadays that's really common. Like a lot of drummers I see just naturally affect their drums and do, sh you know, it's right. It's gone beyond, way beyond what I'm talking about. I mean, right. there's drummers doing shit live that's just, you know, using delays and distortion and like triggering samples and right, right, using. Uh, yeah, there's so much going on now. So, Honestly, so when you did that Fiona record, that first Fiona record was was some of that stuff like your influence then, like since you had already gotten in that mode a little bit, like. Just sonically? It was just kind of searching. We were just like, okay, we did. Like, I remember like the very first Fiona record, we didn't know what, she didn't know what she wanted to sound like. And we didn't know, like, you know, when we first heard her songs, we thought she sounds like an R&B girl singer, like pop R&B girl. Like mm -hmm. to us, it almost sounded like it could be like Mariah Carey or something. Like if it was produced like that. Oh, wow. Really? Cause if you just, if you didn't know her now and just heard the demo tapes before you would just think it, these are really cool, soulful r and influenced songs, but okay. um, there was no um, like production uh, idea behind it because oh, wow. they could have gone any way. Okay. You know? um, so that was like a collective effort, like a band effort that kind of like created yeah. that sound and. Yeah, like John Bryan being there with he had <laughs> it was the first time I worked with him and met him. Mm -hmm. He when he showed up at the session, he had like like crates of like weird old mics and like he had a bunch of drums, but he was just playing guitar on the session. So he had like all these old drums and like he had like boxes of clothes there and shit. <laughs> it was I think he was homeless at the time and he was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to store all my shit. Here. Sleeping at Largo on the stage. <laughs> yeah. And there was all that stuff just lying around. And I remember we initially, I mean, at that time I was, I don't, you know, I thought, okay, maybe her music needs to be aggressive. So I like, I remember like the first versions of a lot of those songs, I'm just playing like I'm playing with PJ Harvey or something. Oh yeah. And um, trying to do like, the rock thing, you know, right. and, and that didn't work so well. Okay. Um, and it was, was a process. Was like, like we eventually obvious. stumbled. What's that? That was like obvious. Like, like that. after the first, yeah. After the first day, we we're just like, man, eh, that's not working. Right. Okay. Um, because she wasn't like a rock, like she didn't, yeah, the I mean, she, it was more like a jazz singer or something, you know? Right. right. But we thought maybe it'd be cool because, you know, it was the mid nineties. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, know? yeah. And that um, it was like, I mean, by it, that was like 95, I think it was 95. 94, 95. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. And, and because you had been like practicing with like the Sans Amp stuff that must've like started to like, go like, Oh wait, I could, even though I'm not saying there's Sans Amp all over that record. I don't think there's any that I know of, but just playing that way and that palette that was, I would imagine coming from like listening to yourself, playing through that was started to influence you. Yeah. I do remember that uh, 
what's that song? Uh, Criminal and Sleep to Dream. Yeah. I remember thinking at the time, it'd be cool to program some drums. And at that time, like the Portis Head record had just come out and all that. And I was thinking it'd be cool to do that kind of thing where it's like lo-fi program drum sounds. Yeah. But I didn't have, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have anything to program with. Right. So I was just like, let's just make the drums sound like they're programmed, like they're samples. And so they just put like, you know, John had these old mics and they put this one mic on the kit. Um, it's that American mic. Yeah. You know, the one. Uh-huh. The so like they put kind of thing. Yeah. It's silver and it kind of goes like, oh, it's that's like not a, the one that D, okay. the D22. Okay. I think it's called a D22. And so they put that like right in front of like kind of where the rack tom and kick drum is pointed at the snare. And then that was like the majority of the drum sound. Yeah. They compressed it and EQ'd it and then added the kick drum mic. And so that was the drum sound for Sleep to Dream and, and Criminal. But it was all just to make the drums sound like they were a Portishead record or something like that, which were grainy, 12-bit. Yeah, like the 12-bit kind of. Yeah. But then I just played it. I didn't know how to make loops then. I was just like, fuck it, I'm just gonna play then. And and they're like, great, it sounds cool. Let's keep it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's interesting. So it was like a collective like you and it was Mark Ender, right? Yeah. yeah. Mark Ender. Yep. Right. And it then- was just more of like, hey, let's try this mic. I mean, because we were just like sitting there going, I don't know what to do on this song. Like, you know, we recorded the drums sounding really nice and fat and hi-fi, and they just sounded like, eh. You know, wasn't that special? She she needed like an angle, like a sonic, yeah, thing. So, and then is that kind of what happened, like with Tory records too, like those early Tory records? Because like that stuff, especially like Venus and Back, that that's like one of the most space age records I've like <laughs> heard, like still. You know what I mean? Really? Wow. I think so. Cool. Think so. Well, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I have a hard time listening to stuff and getting any kind well, of guess- perspective. I guess it's when you do it, you don't, you know, it's hard to have the perspective, right? But like for me, that that record was like, holy fuck, what is happening on here? Right. Well, you know, there was a guy that used to be like, uh, there was this guy named Andy Gray who was a uh, electronic music guy in, in the UK. Okay. And he used to work with, I think he worked with like Massive Attack and BT and all these electronic artists. And at the time, this guy was part of Choir Girl choir girl hotel and venus and back he was there to facilitate any kind of synth stuff for like if i wanted to like play my taos drums and have them loop them and do shit and then he and then he had his whole palette of cool shit that he'd do like he'd be like hey let's run the drums into this arc 2600 that i have here and use the filters and and so his influence on those records was massive and if I, if I wanted to do stuff, like there's a song on, I think it's on Venus and back called Daytura that Tori had like a piano riff and I just played and it was like some odd meter thing, but then it went to the B section and I was like, how about if we have two drum kits and like one in each speaker going into those Mooger Fuger. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- those Mooger Fuger envelope filters. Yeah. And Andy Gray, the electronic guy was like, yeah, mate, let's do it. And so, you know, it was easy enough to do it. Cause he was, he, he knew how to do that. Like he was into that shit. So, um, it helped a lot to make it unconventional from a, 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 a drum point of view. Right. Um, because, cause her, her engineer, um, is her husband and the guy who does live monitors and they were real, purists you know they just wanted to record things the way they are oh wow and so (laughs) yeah so having andy there really helped me to like get more experimental and make it easy to do you know because we didn't have any fancy mics or anything it was like it was out at tori studio at her house okay we had normal old you know 414s and 421s and right right so was that stuff happening? Like, would you pull up a, would you dial in a sound and then go for a take? So you were like playing off that stuff or was that a lot of it post, you know, it's a little bit of both, a little bit of both. Yeah. That was back when Tori, like Tori would do stuff 
where before I got to the studio, she will have recorded her take that she liked. Oh. And so I'd have to figure out how to play to that. And um, sometimes it would be without a click track. Okay. And so, um, wow. but, some, but most of the time, like on, there, there was a record she did before I met her and worked with her called Boys for Pele mm. that she had Manu Kache play drums on. And she didn't do any of that to a click. And Manu had to play to her tracks that she had finished. And I know he had a hard time. I mean, I mean, any drummer would to, yeah. you know, play to a piano player with no click track. <laughs> it's a little, little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the way like most stuff goes with her or, or was back in that. It day? was, I mean, now it's like we have, we just did a new record that comes out in a couple weeks on October 29th. Mm. And, and now of course she, she'll like do her, well, well, the way it was now, or on this record, she just sent me a rough of her playing piano or, you know, Rhodes or whatever she's playing and a rough vocal. And then I just put what I thought worked and sent it back to her. And then she recuts her vocal okay. and piano to my drum track and then send. Oh, you know, wow. interesting. Okay. It's like the pandemic way of recording. <laughs> um, and then send it to the, send it to John, the bass player. And then, right. So, um, I think I think over time she realized it was just easier for everybody if we were going to overdub to her to have a click track, right? But a lot of times, I mean, you know, she she was so against click tracks, which I don't blame her. You know, mm -hmm. I remember once she said, <laughs> I think she said it like in a magazine interview about click tracks. She's like, you know, people don't fuck the click tracks. <laughs> or something like that like like you know the, the rhythm of life right. has nothing to do with consistent time it's like an emotion you know it's a dynamic it's like a it's like loud and soft slow and fast you know right and it makes sense i mean most really? music is like that you know yeah so um i but get part, it part of your part of your day back then recording record was okay i gotta come in and i gotta learn not only the tune but the the time feel to get a good take and then do the sonic thing like in conjunction with or after to make it interesting. Yeah. That's pretty fascinating. And luckily with her records back then, we were all at her studio in the middle of nowhere in, in Cornwall, England. Right. And we would be there for six weeks. Right. So like by the time you left, you were like a crazy person. You hadn't seen anybody else. <laughs> You're like in the airport going, Whoa, <laughs> I must look like a completely insane person to everybody. I've just, I've been on a farm for six weeks playing right. music every day. <laughs> well, that's an insane experience though, man. Like, like it was, I learned so yeah, much. Yeah. Being able to crazy sonically and just playing like, like that every day. Cause like those tunes are kind of crazy, you know? I mean, they're not yeah. conventional. Let's just say that. Yeah. She was writing some really interesting stuff. Yeah. And she's, you know, she's obviously open to, anything as long as it felt good or conveyed what she was trying to say in the lyrics or right in the music you know she's not she she's not too tied down to convention or worry worrying about if it's a hit or not right you now that's for sure right so, right um yeah and that's definitely but, but those records were i mean then after andy gray left we got more into like acousticness you know just trying to make everything acoustic mm -hmm. sounding and natural or just playing because we toured so much. We were just like, let's just try to play together and capture that. Right. So, but I, I, I really enjoy the, the science laboratory experiment way of recording. It's always fun. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, it's interesting to me to, to learn that. Cause like, like I said, like some of those records just like, holy shit, how did you, how did anybody think of that? Those sounds, you know? Right. I don't know. Is that <laughs> <to me? laughs> I like, I like that. That's your answer. I don't know. <laughs> nobody, nobody had any, uh, like, you know, notebook with rules or anything like that in it to like, tell us what to do. It was just right. Just kind of go for it. So, all right. So when you're recording now in your room, let's, let's say, let's say the pandemic never existed. Right. And you we were just doing your thing. Do you, do you like to have people come by a lot or you, prefer to like do the kind of do it on your own or, or whatever. 
I guess it all depends on what kind of music you're talking about. Okay. You know, like if it's more, if it's the kind of thing where they're asking me to do something uh, a little more exploratory, I, I like working by myself at first Mm -hmm. and then getting some feedback, right. Make sure I'm going down the right road. But if it's, if it's somebody that has songs and they just want to come in and like have the drum kit, just be like a supportive role and, do the drum kit thing. Mm-hmm. I, I'd rather have them here. Right. Um, it just makes it go faster. Cause you know, a lot of times, um, well, you know how it is. If you're doing remote stuff, like you'll think it sounds really cool and you think your approach is going to work. And then you send them a, a rough mix of it. And they're like, actually, <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst, man. Like, My shit is killing right now. I'm going to send yeah. this stuff. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like oh fuck i totally got it wrong right I, I thought you were going for this kind of thing or yeah so it's a lot of times it just makes it easier if they're here because they can just go yes yeah. no and they're right here and you can get a lot more done and everybody everybody's happy that happens to me every time i decide to use a high snare sound i'm like uh-huh. i'm like I'm, i just want to do something different man nobody wants a high snare anymore i'm gonna crank this thing up and and I'm like, this is slamming. And you send it off. They're like, yeah, I was thinking like, uh, no, <laughs> like <laughs> it's something that goes thud. <laughs> like, of course I can, but damn it. <laughs> that's, that's where we're at now. Pretty soon snare drums are just going to be like bass drums with rattles on them. <laughs> it's like, boom, 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 boom. I think we're there. Yeah. We're, we're getting down to peak, peak, low pitch snare drum exactly. time. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I keep wanting. I keep wanting to do the same thing. I keep thinking, uh, like cymbals with high end and and drums that are tuned higher might be fun. Yeah, worked before. <laughs> They've worked on plenty of records before. <laughs> but um, toms but, and high snares. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. It's just I'm sure it's going to come around. It always comes around. But but right now it seems like we've been stuck in the '70s for a long time. I mean, actually, a lot longer than the 70s were stuck in the 70s. Right, know? right. Yeah, like, it can't get any more dry than it is right now. Like, yeah, and it does sound really good. It's like a, um, you know, it, it draws you in. It leaves a lot of space for other instruments. I mean, it's it's good. It's a good sound, but um, there's other sounds. We all know there's other sounds. <laughs> At least that's what I've heard. I've heard there's other drum sounds. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing I could do is listen to like an expensive Winos record right before I'm going to do something else. And yeah, I love that sound. Oh, (laughs) no, (laughs) can't do that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's weird how things, I mean, yeah, I, I guess the, 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 um, thing now, since a lot of people are recording on their own, it's just an easier way to get a drum sound too. If you just muffle everything down, it, it's so easy. Right. I mean, and most people are in small spaces recording. So I think a lot of it's just people just want, like they're so used to samples, they want separation. And when they get real tracks, they're kind of like, Whoa. like there's yeah, too chaotic, like what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense, I guess. But I don't know. I just, I, I've, I've always been a fan of like, if, if you can do a record with somebody and, get away with having the drum sound change a little bit during the course of the record, mm-hmm. you know, where it's not just all like super dead and fat, which we all know sounds really good. I mean, it always, it always works, but nobody's hating here. <laughs> I mean, do, do you remember, I, I was just remembering this the other day. Like I, I remember doing records in the nineties. I and mean, of course, you know, it was the nineties. It's a different time, but I remember producers asking me for snare drums that had more attitude like, hey, do you have a snare drum that has more attitude or has like an an angle or something that's like that has a tone to it or is aggressive or or screwed up sounding? And now it's just, you know, right. you have a snare drum that's super low and fat. And, right. You know, you get lots of, you, you know, now you just get different degrees of crispiness in the snares. Like some dead snares are more dull than other dead snares, you know? <laughs> Well, I can pull out my eight inch radio King or my <laughs> seven inch a yacht or my, uh, my, or my 15 inch. Loaded. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's, they're all different degrees of dead. Yeah. But there used to be a time when producers would ask you for like a snare drum that was jacked up sounding. 
like that had a weird ring in it. Like, and you know, worked in the track. Right. But, um, nobody ever does that. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like those sounds require some ambience though, which is like, yeah, a room. Yeah. A room for it really to like speak correctly, which is, yeah. you know, that somebody has got to want to go for that. And that's because of a ringy, overtoned snare drum really sounds like shit when there's one mic on it. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's true. I guess people are recording in smaller spaces. So the dead drum sound makes more sense, but. Oh, I was going to ask you when you did that Chad Blake session that you were talking about back in 95, were you in a vocal booth? Do you remember? Uh, no, it wasn't in their classic spot. Cause they used to put the drums in that tiny little room. Yeah. This was actually in the room because we were recording live. Okay. And I remember he had he had this Indian PA system that had like the little a little amp and it had this crazy ass delay built into it and this and it was a giant horn and that was like the PA system. It was like one of those like Indian market PA systems, you know? Okay. I don't know, but yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you see those big horns that some people have and like the Vitrola you know, kind of look yeah for like a a, a outdoor sound system like you know like at airports or i don't know back in the day okay and so anyways he had one of those behind the singer's head and like the horn was like right behind her head <laughs> and it was like doing this delay sound going into her vocal mic i mean he was just onto some crazy shit back then wow pretty cool and that was in the room while you were tracking and we're all in the same room pretty much yeah from what i recall i remember the singer was we were just baffled you know, it's just right. Wow, that's crazy. That's fucking cool. Yeah. What's that record called? Uh, fruit, fruit of Life. Okay. Fruit of Life. But of course, when they so they did one day there, and then they went to Real World Studios uh -huh. with um Pete Thomas from the yeah you know, Ellis Costello's band. Yep. And they recorded a bunch of stuff there as well. Yeah. But the stuff that we did on that one day became the majority of the record. But he didn't mix it. Um, to sound as weird as it did when we were tracking it. It just sounds like... Oh, you know, interesting. Okay. Yeah, it just sounds like a band in a room. Okay. He must have got pressured by the record company or something. To I make mean, that happens. I I've, I yeah. feel like I've had that a lot, where like you leave the studio and you're like, we did some crazy-ass shit, and then you come out and you're like, oh, it's not... <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The adults entered the room and turned <laughs> off all the cool shit. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, when you program stuff, especially like with your modular synth, do you do you tend to do that f first or second? Is that a? Do you know um, what I mean? Do, do you want? Do, do you like to play along with that, or do you think you build it around maybe what you did already? Do you mean like when I I write? my modular synth things. That yeah. I, I mean, I guess with anything, oh. but sure. Let's say when you're writing your own shit. Yeah. With the modular. Yeah. With me at this point, the modular synth is so, um, improvisational. Like once you get going, I just put it in record and just start, you know, I'll send it a click. So it's, it's being, uh, clocked to like the grid and pro tools and I'll just improvise with it. Okay. For as long as I want. And then I'll go back and, find the bits I think would be a cool a section and a B section and just kind of make an arrangement. Okay. And then I'll learn it and then play it on drum kit, like play the drums to it. Okay. And then do you write melodies and stuff or whatever over that? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll overdub things around it. Right. Later. If, <clears throat> if I think, Oh, I need to, you know, it's, this, this is just a baseline. I need to add like some kind of counterpoint or some chord thing or. Yeah. I mean, my, my uh, chordal knowledge is pretty limited, but I try. <laughs> and and the modular is generally like a drone based instrument for me. You know, it doesn't really change keys. It kind of right. You know, I can I can do stuff where I can make it sound like it's changing keys by just messing with right. harmony and stuff like that. But right at this point, I haven't really mastered changing keys on the modular. <laughs> I, I, don't think, I don't think many people have actually. I mean, most people that use the modular synth are kind of in drone land, right? You know? Kind of like getting into these moods and yeah. Um, I mean, there there are ways to change keys. I have this little module I just bought that is called a, a quantizer, and it it uh it, it rounds the notes off to the nearest real note. 
so oh, you can wow. make like minor and major scales out of it and you can do and you can transpose it so as it's playing you can transpo transpose the, the bass line and and that's all just improvisational too like i'll just record like here's a one one to the six to the four right. to the one to the two you know like i'll just try stuff out and then right chop chop okay cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> My brain is swimming. The modular thing, man, I've, I have not gone down that rabbit hole. I, I really want to, but that's a monetary rabbit hole that, you know, yeah. I got, it's, it's tempting. <laughs> it's tempting because each module is about the price of a guitar pedal. Right. But then you just start adding them up and you're like, ah, I could have right. bought a car. Right. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> or a microphone or like a couple of microphones or I could have just put it into my savings account. And, yeah. But they hold value. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not that I know. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I'm sure somebody. I'm sure somebody would buy that off me. Hell yeah. For, for less than I bought it for, probably. But yeah, it's more of just a tool for being creative. Do you feel like you use it for conventional songs, like people when people send you stuff, much, or is it really more like your own kind of creative outlet? Kind of my own. I mean, the one stuff I, or the one thing I'll use it for that I've just discovered over the past year is not having it be a uh, note based, just having it be more like white noise, almost like evolving hi hat electronic sounds. Mm -hmm. I use that a little bit on Tori's record. Okay. And um, and there are some modules that are just effects modules. So I bought, you know, have you seen those Moog drum machines? Those DFAM. I love the DFAM. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll run that into like, there's like a delay and like a weird verb. Right. Thing. And then there's like a random, this, this uh, module called beads. That's, I don't even know what the hell's going on with it. It's just, <laughs> you can like capture chunks of audio and then like a freeze, freak it out. Yeah. But you can also, uh, with the CV, cause you know, the, uh, modulars are all controlled by control voltage, which means, um, any knob that's on it can be controlled with control voltage. So you can send uh, a, a waveform to one of the controllers, like any knob basically, and and automate it with control voltage. So you can, right. and you can also send it a, a time, like right. a clock. So once you capture like a chunk of audio on this weird ass thing, you can clock it and have it be in time, even though it's randomizing itself which is really fun. Right. But all this stuff is like, I just improvise to the song. And if anything works, I'll just chop it up and use it in like a section or something like that. It's okay. It's more like if you have time to screw around with the track, I could never take this shit to like a session and be like, <laughs> hold on, just hold on for two hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Because right. it, it generally just sounds horrible. You right. know, like, you know, the artist would just be like, nope, that's not working. Nope, nope, right. that's not working. It's like, hold on a second. Give me two hours. <laughs> Funny. I feel like that with the Nordrum 3, too. Like, uh -huh. I love that thing. I love how it sounds. But you got to have time to tweak it, you know? I'm like, I got a cool idea. I've taken it to, like, two or three sessions. And I was like, give me a thing and patch it in here. And I sit there with my headphones for, like, 20 minutes. Okay, I finally got it. Like. It's like, okay, now you get to record each sound because I'm not going to play it. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like some things are just not conducive to like, you know, real time hanging out, making shit. You just got to have time to tweak. Yeah, yeah. With electronic drum stuff, for sure. I mean, because a lot of it's the sound and just giving people, like you said, like having each track be separate so they can mix it properly and have it be yeah impactful yeah and all that um yeah that's that's like production i think to me that's like right borders on sound design production right that takes time and like i don't know if it's a different, I hat. It's, a different it's a totally different job really right it's like, yeah it is it is because there's people that are so good at it that i'm just amazed i'm you know i'll, I'll listen to records and just for that because i just don't understand how they get things to sound so good and so like like the audio spectrum is so deep but it's all electronic it's you know there's nothing acoustic it's right. like you know whenever i try to program stuff it just sounds flat <laughs> compared to like the really great 
you know, like the really great programmers. Um, who, who are your, some of your favorite? Well, like there's the, there's the ones like the, you know, the, the legends that I, I always go back to like Aphex Twin, Square Pusher and Amon Tobin. Right. And um, like recently, like for instance, this morning I was listening to, there was this artist that just passed away about six months ago named Sophie. Okay. Ever heard? She's, or he, I think she was transgender. Wait, artist. I think I just listened to something, something and you played on. I played on? No? Played okay. On. All right. Then it's something else. Never mind. But um, the record, there's one record um, they put out that it obviously sounds like it was done. To me, it sounds like it was just all on the laptop. But the sounds are so extreme and so digital and so um, they're just really, excuse me, really different. And there's another artist named Arca. Okay. Who, who just, I think he collaborated with Bjork on a record a couple of years ago. Okay. And it's all just sound design. It's like, you know, they're making beats out of sound and, but the beat is also the melody maybe, or the bass line. It's not right. You know, it's not drums, bass, synth, you know, it's like, right. it's all kind of together. Yeah. Like the 808 bass line thing, but like to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole, I mean, that's a whole world of, um, yeah, it has nothing to do with playing drum kit <laughs> to right. me. Right. You know, it's like, it's a whole other thing. Right. Which I always fantasize like in another life, I would just be the guy with the laptop, like <laughs> just doing that. I don't have any drums or anything. I'm snaking shit. <laughs> Again, that's when, that's when you're 72, 72. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just online buying plugins and soft synths, <laughs> drinking way too much coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and somehow making money <laughs> right i don't know <laughs> or not yeah i don't know or, yeah I don't, that would be incredible yeah but it's a um that's a whole other world but i i like it so i try to figure out ways to do it with my instrument like that's why i set up that little rig i showed you earlier with the percussion and the yeah um live looper the second like run it into guitar pedals and just get some kind of of that kind of vibe going and have it be different than what those people do that are just in, in the box, you know, like give it the angle of somebody who plays drums. Right. I, mean, I thought it would be great just to like hook up an electronic drum kit to a bunch of like get some, uh, you know, a collection of sounds that you really want to use for a record and just do a whole electronic record, just playing the Ableton live and just freak out and, just use those sounds, you know, all the samples and make an electronic record. Don't have any acoustic drums on it. And it'd be fun just to give it like a, you know, drummer angle. Cause most drummers do it with acoustic drums. Right. I mean, like you see a lot of guys that are influenced by drum and bass and well, it's, it's almost like we're chasing that now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's why not just do it. Why not just do the real, sh like instead of, <laughs> instead of like making your acoustic drums, try to sound electronic. Why not just go fully electronic? And just make a electronic an electronic record from a drummer's perspective. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool. I mean, I know it's not as much fun. I mean, it's more fun to play acoustic drums, and and it's more fun to think about uh, you know um, extending the sound palette of what we do on our instrument. But right. At a certain at, at a certain point, you're still playing just an acoustic drum kit. You right. know. Right. You're going to be. You're limited to. You're going to trigger some shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess for me, it's like the, the whole thing of like chasing it is like definitely takes up a lot of headspace for me, like chasing those sonic things. Oh, can I do that? Can I show up somewhere and like do that thing to make it like kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, I guess you're just talking about like going beyond that, like fuck doing that. Just like actually do it. Like just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it is fun. I mean, in the studio with acoustic drums, you can do anything really. I mean, you can, you know, how it is, you can run your drums in the guitar pedals or trigger shit or, you know, it's, it's endless. The weird thing is um, like, is like, you know, on most electronic shit though, like the, the, 
like your touch disappears, right? Like you could, you could like get your, your sounds, like your, maybe they're even totally unique sounds. Like you created all these sound design from nothing, but then you're playing, but like, it might be hard to tell that it's you in a sense, no. like playing wise, because like, you know, you have a certain touch, like any drummer does, right? Has a certain touch. But like, I've heard guys play an X- SPD who are really great at it. But it's also like, well, right. it could be anybody, kind of, right. you know? Yeah, there's, well, that's kind of the beauty of electronic music, I guess, is that there's no, there's, there's no ego personality that's like the person doing the music and a lot of electronic music. It's just electronic music. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, there's just, there's drums and there's things going on and it's the sounds and it's not a personality. I mean, maybe it's like the compositional style or something, but um, maybe I, I just that, that, maybe I just can't get out of my own like headspace to to go down that road. You know? No, I understand. I mean, I think it would be cool to hear, like you know, if you were freaking on some electronic drums and you did a record, and I'd be like, oh yeah, it sounds like Blair mm. doing his thing. But but generally, you wouldn't know. <laughs> generally, right. you just be like just electronic music uh right i mean i guess after a while you develop a style like anything right yeah like maybe it's the sounds right you use or something or it's not based on your it's your it's the music you make yeah yeah it's more of the music you make than the way you play maybe or it's just your choices that's a whole study in ego right there (laughs) it's like it's like loving the music more than you love playing your instrument (laughs) and that's the thing Right? It's hard to get out of. It's a thing. Because yeah. we spent a lot of time on our instruments. Yeah, especially if you're from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. God. I'm playing my instrument. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. No, but there's a, there's something to be said for being able to play your instrument, <laughs> which a lot of people don't in electronic music. They just yeah. make sense and create moods. Right. You know? Right. Yeah, it's like it's definitely two different headspaces. Yeah. And plus recording drums is way more fun than just triggering samples. Yeah. Way more fun. Says two drummers talking to each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if you talk to any engineer <laughs> too, it's like, what do you like doing? It's like, you know, recording drums is it's like the most it's the craziest shit because there's so many variables. You know, you yeah. think you got it figured out, and then you go to another room, another engineer, same drum kit, and it's like totally different. Right. You know, it's like, oh, I, I finally found two snares that work for everything. And then you go to a different room and it's like, no. Right. <laughs> Where's the low end? Yeah. I mean, what happened? Where's the, yeah. <laughs> or the way the engineer mics the drums. It's like, well, hey, man, this kick drum sounded great yesterday. What, what's up? <laughs> what you do? What'd you do, I didn't, change, I didn't change anything. Your fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It is. It's are you, it's are, like, you in, are you working out of your room like 90% of the time as far as like sessions? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, but yeah, recently. I, I'm always like, all right, not, excluding pandemic. You know what I mean? If we can think that way. Like, okay, let's say in 2019, were you like mainly in your room? It was a little bit of both. Probably mainly here. Um. Cause you know, nobody really has the budgets they used to have and they're always trying to figure out ways to make their records for, yeah, you know, whatever they get. Right. This makes sense. It's like, Hey, let's go to this guy's room. I mean, drums are always the most expensive thing to record, right? You got to have a room and right. everything else. You could just put a mic on the amp or, I mean, a lot of times you don't even need an amp anymore. Right. You just right. go right. direct. Yeah. So, and they sound amazing. Like there's so many, IR thing is it sound amazing that yeah 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 and drums you still kind of need a, a space to a certain extent I guess right depending on what you're doing I, I mean, never I, I never know what to bring anymore if I have to leave my room I'm like yeah shit <laughs> wait I have to decide between like 15 pairs of hi hats which which <laughs> <three> <laughs> <bring>. <laughs> that's a tough choice man those are like you know that could keep you up at night you know. I know. It's true. 
because you get used to working on your space and having all your stuff available. And then when you go to a studio, you can't bring everything. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah. Actually, I'm experiencing this tomorrow. I'm doing a session with humans in another room. And I'm like, uh, I could bring, you know, I'm going to bring a couple of bags of symbols. Some, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to see what happens. I mean, if I need something, I can always go to my studio and grab it, but right. Um, I don't know, I'm just so used to having everything here. Like, if I'm recording a song, I could be like, ah, actually that drum would be great for this song. And these weird hi-hats would be great. Yep. yep. Just get used to it. Yep. I think the, I think it's, having your own space to record make, makes it more creative to a certain extent Yeah, as far as sounds go. And- well, you know, there's also the interesting thing that I've, I've experienced right lately a couple of times where like I, I am limited to what I can bring and then, but then it forces me into that headspace again of like, okay, I don't have that, you know, set of hi hats that I want to have right now. What can I do to get closer to it? What can I do to these to get closer to it? And like just those limitations, those forced limitations, which sometimes we don't have to have. Yeah. Yeah. Room. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of refreshing. Actually, my favorite thing is just to go, you know, since most engineer producers, other musicians have studios now with a drum kit, mm-hmm. I love just going and just playing other people's shit. Right. It usually sounds better than mine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that, but I know what you mean. But yeah, you show up and they have something cool or something wonky and you're like, oh, that's kind of fucked up. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like something you wouldn't have thought of. Like there's a, you ever go up to Dave Way's studio? Yeah. I love how, like you show up and you're like, what is going on with the miking on this drum kit? Like, it's so, it yeah. seems random. But yeah. It always sounds so good. Right. And he's got that little small room, but it's like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I went. I went to. I went to have somebody out with their studio recently, and they had like a cool little Gretsch, Gretsch round badge kit, which I don't. I don't own one. I'm like, oh, this is fucking fun to play on this thing, you know? Yeah. And there's like two wonky ass cymbals, you know, like a 16 inch crash, and like, you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna make this sound good. This is gonna be fun. Yeah. And it probably sounded great, right? Yeah, it's fun. It's yeah. Fun. And then they have like, you know, what four mics, and you're like, okay, this is the thing that we're doing today we're gonna make it dope <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love it i love it. and then you learn a little bit about like oh this is how other people mic drums i mean that that used to be the thing back before the pandemic of just working with different engineers just right there was always some little angle right they would have on how to mic the drums or something you know like, yeah that's one of my favorite fun. things actually is to have a real engineer come here yeah and be like, hey, do you have a different inside kick mic? Uh, <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Why? What are you What are you hearing that I'm not? I don't. You know that. Yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah. I love that. I love that because it always sounds way better than anything I could do because they're sitting in here listening to me play. Right. And they kind of get the idea of what's going on. So. Right. Yeah. Well, hopefully this pandemic will get sorted out in the next year, and we'll be back to normal. I hope. Yeah, I know. Recording with other humans. I like playing with other humans. I do too. I'm, I'm all right. I'm itching to like play out a little more. So you know, I'm ready. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure now. Like once the pandemic gets, you know, kicked to the curb, I'm sure everybody's going to be like recording. <laughs> I <did that. laughs> I know, right. <laughs> right. I've been doing that for two wanna, years. Right. Yeah. I don't ever want to do that again. I just want to play live. You know, everybody will be selling their shit on eBay. And yeah. everybody, <laughs> everybody get a gig fast because recording is about to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Record. You can't even sell a record. What's the point? Wow. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> it is sad, but true. Somehow people manage to still make money at it. I don't understand. But yeah. It's probably because they're not selling records or, you know, they're selling underwear or vodka or something. Yep. That's exactly it. Yeah. You got to start your tequila business on the side, and yeah, yeah, we should start a tequila business. I, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> I have some ideas, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are you uh, are you working this afternoon, or did you just come up to yap with me? I don't know. I might. <laughs> okay. I'll probably set up my kit. I'm still trying to get. You know, I bought that uh, Billy Martin book. 
Have you seen oh, that yeah. drum book? Uh huh. Have you have you uh, gotten into it? Check it out. You posted it some great like, thing though, some crazy snare too the other day. Oh yeah, I like to do that at home when I'm jacked up on coffee. <laughs> had I like to torture myself. What was that? that? That was a book that Alex Acuna told me about. Oh wow! What was it called? It's like a one of them weird like snare drum books from the seventies. Like it starts off with like polyrhythms, and then it just has all these snare drum etudes. Okay. And every once in a while, I'm like. Maybe I can still read. Maybe I can, you know, it's right. just fun to try to, right. I mean, there's no reason for me to, I mean, I don't, I never have to play a snare drum etude. Thank God. But it's, you know, takes what, if, me back. what if you read some crazy ass shit, then like, you know, when that chart comes out in front of you, that's like, you know, you have to hit the end of three. You at least remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man. I mean, shit happens sometimes. Like I'm sure you've done a lot of, uh, sessions for uh composers you know for soundtracks and they'll write the drum parts out midi and some of them are impossible to play if right. you're and right. you got to kind of decipher it and still right figure out how to make it work for them and some of it's insane it's like reading an etude i find like I, I get like these uh producers from like taiwan they like to program drums and they mm -hmm. want they want you to replicate it you're kind of like really like <laughs> Maybe I could just do what I do. <laughs> it might be good. Yeah. But then you're like learning the MIDI shit and you're like, ah, oh, you know, that's not yes. what a drummer would do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an ass kicker. Yeah. But that, yeah, and, Devin, I, that and Devin, right? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that took me like, a, that song took me like a day to chart out. <laughs> It's like nothing's in four four, and it just kept changing. I don't even know what was going on. I just, uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I like to practice still. I, you know that Billy Martin book though. It took me like three months to get through the first page. Have wow, you, have really? you seen that? No, just because of the there's like, it's kind of like the new breed in a way where you play one pattern with your hands. Yep, and then your feet do like there's like three or four different options. And the same with your left hand, uh -huh. but there's like, and it's all like the first page is all like six, eight, like, dun, 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 dun. but there's one option that's like hi-hat kick. It's like one, two, three, four, left, right, left, right, left, right. Oh, wow. You have to do that while you're doing the fucking patterns and that shit made me nuts for like two or three months. And you were doing it with a hi-hat and a, and a kick or a double kick. It's a hi-hat and a kick. Okay. So the hi-hat does like that triplet right before the downbeat. Yep. 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 Yeah. And then do you have to switch it after that? Yeah, I just randomly like to, I like to torture myself by doing that stuff every once in a while. I mean, that reminds me of the Garibaldi book, which I always hated, you know, but it was good for like, you know, everything like kept moving a 16th note, you know? Yeah. At it's a certain good point, stuff. Like, at a certain point, you're like, this doesn't groove, but I'm going to try to play it, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those kind of books to me are like, you can, I, I have a short attention span for getting through a lot of it all at once, but I'll get through like two or three pages and then it sparks something. Right. You know what I mean? Like you go off into something. I think that's half the idea at this point, like as old as we are, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> there's no time for like, you know, mastering things. You're just sparking new ideas. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, How yeah. old are we now? I don't know. Oh, We're from the nineties. Like you said, the 90s, exactly. Yeah. That's a long time ago. <laughs> Denton doesn't look like it used to, man. <laughs> what does it? Denton. Oh, De oh, yeah. I haven't been to Denton since the nineties, probably. Oh, there you go. See. Yeah. I only drove by it once, and it, I didn't recognize it. So, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was just good just to hang. It's like our virtual hang. We've I know we've been hanging a lot lately, uh, non, non, non physically, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The way you do it now, I guess it's a mystery to me. 
It's because I'm it's because I'm from the nineties. I don't understand these things. <laughs> Nobody has to talk to me about this. I, I that's my whole thing. It's like I don't have time for that. The shit. I'm 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 still analog at heart, man. You know? Nineties. <laughs> yeah, I mean I figured most people like if there's something important that needs to be uh discovered or or listened to or checked out, somebody will tell me about it. Right. I don't need to go online. I mean, you can discover shit, but I don't need to like be on Instagram and I don't know. It's just, it's more fun to just have people go, man, you got to check this out. Right. Because especially when it's somebody that you're talking to that, you know, like, like that war and peace drums thing. Holy shit. It's so good. Cool. Yeah. They're a trip. Yeah. I expected it to be like, I don't know. I think in my mind, when you said that, it's like drums and vocals. Like for some reason I had like the yeah, yeah, yeahs in my head. Like it's going to be like kind of ratty and like, right. But it's, it's like, she's like soulful and it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, it's totally not what I expected, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's how I found out. I find out about most music anyway. So, right. My friends tell me I'd rather have more friends than, uh, <laughs> Then, then Instagram friends. Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, I'm from the '90s, so yeah, you know, I have a different priority in my life. There's so. some things you can't change, man. <laughs> Call me crazy. I like a Keplinger snare drum. I mean, what are you gonna do? Kill me? Shoot me? <laughs> oh shit! All right, I gotta go. All right, okay, man. <laughs> <I'm being> summoned. <laughs> All right, I'll see you later. All right, dude. Thanks. Okay, bye. Yeah.